It is indisputable that the world we live in today was shaped by the events of yesterday. And yet, historical illiteracy seems to be disturbingly high. Do we need to understand the past to live in the present? Or is history your grandparents' game? Joining us now to help answer that, in the nation's capital, Diane Pecon. She is professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the University of Ottawa. And back here in our studio, Sean Carrage. He is professor of Canadian and environmental history in the Department of History at York University. Christopher Dummett, professor of Canadian history at Trent University in Peterborough. Richard Gwynn, author of the much celebrated two volume biography on Sir Johnny MacDonald. And Matt Gurney, columnist and editorial board member at the National Post. And it's great to have you four here. And Madame Pecon, always a pleasure to see you in our nation's capital. This discussion, so let me set it up a little bit here. This discussion stems from a sense that we have here doing this program that too many people, it feels like, don't have a basic knowledge of big events in history or basic history to understand current events as well as they probably should. And I guess I just want to start by going around our literal and metaphorical table here. Uh, to see if you have examples in your own experiences that confirm that suspicion that we here have. You want to get us started here? Well, it was uh, going back a few years back when I was in school. I was a history major in university, and I was at an after-hours party, we could say, of uh, colleagues and peers uh, at, a, at a friend's house. And one of my friends was in from out of town, uh, very far from out of town. He was in from Israel, where he had just been discharged from the military there. He'd been injured in combat and wasn't fit to serve anymore, so he'd been medically discharged. There was a young lady there who was interested in him. He was still a very strapping young man, and she was asking him, so what are you doing here? Where are you from? And he'd said, well, you know, I just got out of the Israeli military. And she said, oh, what do, why did you choose to join? He's like, well, I was conscripted. And then she says, whoa, they have, why are you conscripted in that country? He's like, well, we have fought a series of wars against our Arab neighbors. And in front of this group of probably 30 or 40 students, she said, this, this might be a silly question, but what's an Arab? And I said, <laughs> Okay, the time, time to go find a different party. We are done here. We're moving on. And she, was, she, was not, she wasn't drunk. She wasn't kidding. She had just simply quite never heard of an Arab. And I should mention by this point, this woman was in a fourth year of a poli-sci course. I'm afraid to ask at what university. Do you want to tell me? <laughs> I, she was from Western. Uh, it was not a party uh, that, uh, it wasn't a Western party, but that's where she was in from out of town, also visiting friends. And if she had simply, I mean, she wasn't asking uh, with any uh, degree of rudeness. She was just simply perplexed and wanted to know more. So she asked the uh, former Israeli uh, officer what an Arab was. What did you think when you heard that? I laughed. <laughs> I laughed really hard, and uh, I, I couldn't repeat on air what my sister said to her at that moment. But uh, it was it was shocking, and you know we we had a good laugh at it, which was probably impolite of us with hindsight. But it was something where I think the the initial impulse, Steve, was that she was honestly kidding. But it became clear very quickly that she was being completely genuine, completely sincere. She was genuinely curious about. Uh, my friend from overseas and uh, wanted to know why uh, Israel needed a military and who these Arabs were. Richard. I don't have a vivid uh, example, a stunning example like uh, Matt, but I do share your view, or at least what you, what you expressed, uh, that history is becoming history. Uh, I have a couple of small examples. Uh, <clears throat> a history professor I was talking to said he finds it very hard to persuade his students to read any thick books. Books, period, but thick books above all. And, they, and when he asks them, he said, they say, I can get anything I want out of Google. The answer is that it's not easy to come up with a smart answer to that statement. The other one was myself. The other day I wrote a column in which I made reference to R.B. Bennett. And I thought, oh, no, I mean, I'm crazy. I mean, nobody's going to, or very few people are going to understand that. So I thought, I took a little time to think, and I, I have to connect him to the Depression, the Great Depression of the 30s. Without that, he would be unknown. Hmm. It is, history is becoming history. Diane Pecon, let's have an example from Ottawa. Well, every day I'm flabbergasted as a professor to see how, uh, unfortunately, my, student, uh, my students are not connected with the past. I teach a course which is called Contemporary European Theory, and I uh, situate some of the authors in, within the dynamics, historical dynamics of the Second World War. And uh, one of my graduate students one day, I was traumatized completely. He told me, uh, could you please tell us more about this war? So I, I said, uh, why? The, 
oh, he said, I don't have all the information. Yes, I heard about Hitler and so on and so forth. So I tried. And then finally, after the course, I took him aside and I said, OK, what's going on? How is this possible? And he said, you know, Madame Pacom, I'm just interested in the historical events that happened after that I was born. And I asked, when were you born? And he told me, 1990. So I, I, I couldn't believe my eyes. So, so this is, was not only something that was uh, not acquired through the childhood, it was a conscious decision that I'm not interested in anything that happened before I was born. You know, so that was like the ultimate traumatic experience for me as an educator. Hmm. So, the, so the Berlin Wall, which came down in 89, I guess, just, just missed it. Just, <laughs> exactly. just missed. Just missed it. Okay. All right, exactly, I, I am exactly. purposefully leaving the history professors for the end here since I suspect you guys uh, deal with this on a daily basis. Sean, how about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we encounter students who are learning history and they're in the process of it. And so I, I certainly wouldn't fault my students uh, as when they come into a Canadian history course not knowing the whole story. Though I certainly expect that they would know some. But I'd say probably the most infamous recent example of a, an egregious and blatant uh, and perhaps even deliberate forgetting of the past is when the mayor of Toronto said to Peter Mansbridge that he was elected with the largest majority in Canadian history when he wasn't even elected with a majority. He doesn't even have the largest uh, number of votes in Toronto's post-amalgamation history. Uh, so I think it spoke a lot to um, whether or not that was a deliberate misstatement or not, but that there was an expectation that an audience would believe him. Well, he did get a lot of, I got 383,000 votes, Absolutely. which was a good chunk of votes. But considerably smaller than Mel Lastman's first election and second election as mayor. That is true as well. <laughs> How about you, Chris? I'm supposed to be pessimistic, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and I'll, I'll stick with you for now, because I, 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 I think it's partly true that people are a bit more, uh, uh, a bit more ignorant, perhaps. Um, I mean, my example actually would be uh, just last night, uh, uh, listening to the, the furor around uh, Calgary West MP Rob Anders. Uh, and he's getting a lot of trouble, and maybe rightly, maybe wrongly, for calling uh, Nelson Mandela a communist. But of course, Mandela was a communist. Uh, he was a member of the Communist Party. He was also was people, someone people considered a terrorist. Um, I think he said that too. And, and that too, yeah, absolutely. He called, him a absolutely. He called him a communist and terrorist. But actually, you know, people in, uh, it was pretty common, commonplace for people in, in Canada and, and, and Britain and the US to call him both those things, and, and not inaccurately. Because history is about complexity, and it seems to me that, that, that that's kind of the point, that he was all of those things. Uh, and you can be mad, and I think maybe you ought to be mad at Rob Enders for still holding those beliefs. But in a sense, he's just saying uh, what, what is actually historically, historically accurate. Do you feel any special opprobrium for your students who don't know history? Because if they're actually taking history, it suggests that they're interested and that maybe they ought to know better? Uh, you know, I, 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 be, I don't look it, but I'm getting older and I'm, I'm becoming less demanding, maybe. Uh, 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 several years ago, I, I would have been more upset about it. I, I'm, I'm not sure that it's any worse than it was. I guess that, that would be my point. I mean, there are more books published in Canadian history now than ever before. There are more people taking history courses. There are more history BAs published every year. You could line them up on, on, on a VIA train and have a, an, an on-day history track across the country. Uh, I think our expectations are different. Uh, that in, in the past, Fewer people would have known uh, history better. And now we have an expectation that a wider section of the population should know, should, should know history. So I think if you actually count the numbers, more people probably know the past than ever before. But we, uh, uh, but, but we, 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 kind of, we kind of have a more e equal citizenship. We think more people sh should know the past. Higher expectations of more people knowing yeah. in the past yeah. what fewer people maybe knew. Yeah. That kind of thing. OK, so he's not, Richard, completely sold on the premise of the whole program here. Not completely. Uh, how about you? It sounds like you are sold on the premise no, of the program. I, I'm aware that, that I, I repeat the phrase the last time, that history is in, at risk of becoming history. Why do you think that is? Um, a whole lot of things. I mean, obviously, the Internet is very important. I mean, the Internet is about the now, the instant. Uh, and history is about yesterday, and you have to think about it and reflect on it. You can't just rattle it off. You can, but you can get any bit of information. You can get an opinion. You can get, put your own opinions down in the Internet in an instant, you know, so that it, history is, in that sense is, is out of date, you know, it is, it is old fashioned, it is a different way of approaching. Uh, I certainly uh, agree with Christopher that there are signs of hope, uh, the military. I mean, the military was nowhere in Canada two, two decades ago. 
Nobody was interested. And today it is a major force or major entity in, in Canadian life. Respected. Respected. Loved. And mm -hmm. one reason for that, to name him because he's so good, Tim Cook, a brilliant writer and brilliant scholar. And he is selling history, military history that is, to Canadians and making it interesting, making it exciting, making it challenging. Uh, and there are other signs that, you know, we may have hit the bottom, you know, and, uh, and this often happens when you hit the bottom, you start to say, hey, we're going to lose something of value. Sort of like in Toronto, desperately Toronto is trying to preserve some old buildings because all we've got is glass towers. So suddenly you, you change your attitude. Uh, the, uh, another thing I think that is promising is this government uh, has made a commitment to turn something called the history of civilization, which I never knew what it was. Uh, and I don't think many people did know what it was, uh, into the his uh, Museum of Canadian History. What that's going to do is bring a lot of debate and a lot of argument, because mostly Canadian history is about you, it's your fault, not my fault. You know, an awful lot of history is about arguing about the other guy being worse than you. And I think that, I hope that the, history, the Museum of Canadian History will encourage Canadians to find that our history is exciting and human and, and, and important. Diane Picon, when your student said to you, I don't care about history that took place before I was born, what did you come back at him with? I couldn't say anything, but it motivated me very much to, to try to understand what were the sociological forces behind this paradigmatic shift. And I tried to see why. And finally, I came with an answer, which is very sociological, is for this younger generation, there is no wisdom in the past. Like, the past is perceived uh, by them as something which cannot bring them anything that they can use in their lives. So, and on top of everything, there is also this idea that today's generation, they live in the present. My generation lived in the future. My mother's generation lived in the past. So each generation has a rapport with time and space, which is very different. But I believe that for my students, uh, the reaction of this young man was very typical, is that what can I learn from the past that can help me today? So I came to the conclusion that uh, for younger people, but I believe it's also the whole society that lives in this state of mind, there is a discontinuity. We live in a world which uh, uh, is, is fragmented. There are some events, they happen, they disappear, there is a creation of another set of events, they happen, and they concern only the people who are entangled with them. So it's a completely different perspective than uh, other generations had before, which they, they, they were living in order to concern serve the richness of the, of the past, to, to use the richness of the past as an element on which they can build their present lives. So it's a very complex and very deep and very new phenomenon, which I consider also quite uh, dangerous in many ways. It is fascinating, Sean, that any student would say, I don't care about history because there's no wisdom in the past, because that's exactly why, I think, we study history because there is wisdom in the past. Well, I mean, it may just be the, the, the younger people that I'm exposed to because I interact with students, but the students that I encounter are actually quite desperate to know more uh, about the world around them, and they come to history classes to seek context, to know um, the context of the political parties that govern their lives. They want to know about the wars that their countries are involved in, uh, and they want to know about the everyday lives of people like them uh, in the past. So I, I don't get a, a strong sense from my students that they're disinterested in history, but that might just be self-selecting because I have students who take history classes classes. But I do uh, disagree somewhat with the idea that the internet has fragmented our attention and is focused on the present. In fact, it, it troubles me the extent to which historians don't embrace the internet as a tool. It's the most powerful tool for the dissemination, uh, accumulation of knowledge in human history. And for historians who spend a lot of time in libraries, uh, it's extraordinary to me that we would even consider turning our backs on the world's largest library that has ever existed. Well, does anybody suggest that? Well, the idea that the internet might be an inhibition to knowing about the past seems preposterous to me. In fact, I think it's the largest tool to know the past better. And I've been right. able to convey this to my students by giving them access to uh, the documents of the past firsthand using the tools of the internet. It's, it's not just the accumulation of the knowledge. I mean, I, sure, it is certainly that. I think it's also the organization of the knowledge. I mean, it's the internet. I mean, just if you use a basic wiki platform, you could tell the best history of 
the Second World War you could ever imagine. You could have you know, a subdomain for European theater, and you talk about this battle. Here are all the people involved. You could click on the links and go to them. I mean, the, the technology is there to basically make the best interactive textbook in history. The problem would be, and this is where I would tend to agree with Richard a little bit, you might only read three of the pages out of the 10,000 and then decide you know about the Second World War because you can recite Rommel's biography you know, from start to finish. Meanwhile, you have no idea what he was doing in Africa and no real interest in it, but man, wasn't the, the gentleman himself interesting? I mean, that's where we come from. We have unbelievable information, organized and presented beautifully. Do we know how it all fits together? That is where I think we're lacking, and I think that's probably something the Internet does not do well. But I think maybe Richard's point, and uh, you, by all means embellish on this, the, the Internet, and Wikipedia in particular, I guess, is I think meant to whet the appetite for information, but it's not meant to be the last word on all of these things. Fair to say? Probably, but in fact, for many people, it is the last word. It is easy. It is, it is you know, handed on a plate. Uh, can I say something about the wisdom of the past? Mm. So I thought that was a very interesting comment. And I think the wisdom of the past is being challenged because everything is so much now, now, as it were. And I think there are two elements that haven't changed at all. One is human nature. I'm a believer that our human nature is compressed in that great poem, not poem, but song in uh, Casablanca, the movie Casablanca. It's still the same old story, a fight for love and glory. That about compasses about 80% of what humans are about, <laughs> you know? It really does, and that hasn't changed. I mean, obviously, things have been profound changes, pr dramatic, fundamental changes in male-female relationships and so on, but basic human character hasn't changed. And I don't think Canada has changed in some of its most important respects, in spite of all the glass towers and blah, blah, blah that we've got now. Um, we're a big, cold country. We've just discovered that we're a big cold country. <laughs> and one of the things this about cold countries, to me, one of the fascinating things about cold countries is you've got to get on with people. You've got to be friendly to your neighbor because something is going to happen where you need him or her to bail you out, to get your car out of a snowdrift, et cetera, et cetera. That's a very important part of Canada that hasn't changed. Secondly, obviously, we're next door to the world's superpower. It may not be as powerful as it was, but it's still a superpower, and we're overshadowed by it. But we spend a lot of time trying to prove to ourselves that we're better off than them, we're better than them. Well, let me follow on that. Sean, do you think that uh, that which we're discussing here today is a uniquely Canadian phenomenon? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, I think you could probably uh, argue that there is greater historical illiteracy in the United States today, perhaps Western Europe, uh, a greater kind of forgetting, especially... Um, I guess at the level of public discourse, the way in which our politicians talk about the past, the way in which the media represents the past, or perhaps more problematically, the way in which contemporary events don't get adequately contextualized when we report on them, where we represent uh, ice storms as though they're novel, or we represent oil spills as though they've never happened before. Uh, and that's where I think uh, that kind of forgetting or that historical illiteracy becomes a, a real problem because it makes it difficult for us to really understand the problems that we're trying to confront today. Deanne, I don't know if you have American colleagues or you know of examples in the United States, but would you say they're better or worse off at this than us? I would say that uh, this problem is not American specifically or Canadian. It is uh, civilizational. Right now, there is a, 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 an issue with our culture, or when I say Western civilization, you know, broadly, is that uh, we have been so much influenced by technology and science and the idea of progress. So we perceive uh, history as something which is not necessarily any more relevant because we have bypassed that era. There is, the continuity has been broken. So therefore, I believe that at different levels, it's a, it's a universal problem in the sense universal when we set Western culture as a parameter that we cannot uh, anymore perceive history uh, with the same eyes of the people who lived in the pre-scientific technological era, because for them it was all about conserving uh, the the uh, the truths, you know, not bypassing them. They were in a, in a, in a mode which was not dynamic, which was static. Now we are constantly, you know, every year there is something which uh, which uh, bypasses what we have no, known. So it's a knowledge which is not necessarily in uh, sync with the historical perspective. The other issue that I just wanted to underline, in the, since the 60s and the 70s, at least 
at the scholarly level, I noticed that uh, we, we decided that uh, we, we shouldn't have a uh, general discourse on humanity. And as you well know, for instance, the feminist, I'm a feminist myself, but I mean, I have a critical perspective on some aspects. When the woman started saying, this, this story was written by white men. It's not his story. We want to write the, the women's story. And they started calling it her story. And then you had every uh, social movement, every specific group uh, uh, deciding to invest history, but within their own perspective and their own objectives, which I believe ultimately was extremely important. But this deconstruction, per se, produces, I believe, in my students, this uh, difficulty of understanding uh, the necessity of, of a global you know, <laughs> view, a global gaze on society. Can I, Chris, get history. you to follow up on that, whether or not young people today are turned off history to the extent they are, because they see it as old white man's history as opposed to a more broad-braced approach? Well, I mean, I think, I think Dion, Dion was talking about the, the fragmentation of history, right? That it's okay. not even just that anymore. It's all this complexity. In fact, it's for, for each man or woman their own history. Uh, and I think she's right that uh, there's something different about how we, how we look at the past today and, and how we compare studying of history with uh, collecting hockey cards or uh, collecting little cat's figurines. Uh, I mean, I love collecting history books and reading history books, although I buy uh, about five times as many as I'll ever read. Uh, and other people collect little cat, cat figurines. And why do you collect them? Why do I collect books? Yeah. I just like the smell of them. <laughs> I, 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 I like to read them. I, I, I like the feel of them. I, I like the way they but look on the shelf. Books in particular. And history books, all books, but history books, yeah. I mean, you put I, them I, up I, on the shelf. I put them on the shelf and I read them. And, and, and I know more today than I did 10 years ago. And I, you know, it's, it's very Whiggish and it's true. Uh, <laughs> but, the, the, but I think what's different is that 50 years ago, uh, my strange fetish would have been considered somehow better than the person who collected cat figurines. It would have been considered of a, a kind of higher order. And today it's not. And today I don't think it is. Huh. Well, let's get to a, a more overarching question here, which is, I know we can all sort of sit around and tut-tut the fact that historical literacy may not be what we wish it were, but let's ask the question. Matt, why should people, in your view, have a basic understanding of their history, of whatever, their country, their continent, their world, whatever. If we go just oh, full cynicism here, a lot of people don't. They, do, they just don't need it. They're going to go about their lives just fine without it. I mean, I think it's unfortunate because, I mean, I think, you know, they'll, they'll miss out the experience of having that stack of books. But there's a lot of people out there who aren't going to need to do it. But I think if you want to be an engaged citizen, if you want to be engaged at a higher level of society, uh, it's, uh, it's already been said. It's, it's the idea of context. You need to know how things fit together. And if you want to have a fragmented history, whether it be feminism or the role of uh, minorities in, you know, the, say, the colonial south of the United States, I mean, whatever, I mean, take your pick, you need to know how it all fits into the bigger picture because you don't understand the problems of today unless you know where they came from. And I mean, sometimes we do get too focused on the next election cycle or the one just passed, but none of, very few of the problems we face today uh, popped into existence, say, since the year 2000. A couple of them probably have because society evolves and we find new ways to screw things up. But in general, it's, I think Richard's quite right, it's the same old story. It's, it's nice to know sometimes what's worked, what hasn't worked, or maybe no one's found a solution that works yet, but at least you know how you got to be where you are. And if you want to know how everything fits together, it helps to have some basic sense of where you came from. And I know it's hard, because maybe arguably, Steve, this is uh, maybe too big to fully digest right now, but maybe we just have too much history. I mean, maybe there's so much of it out there, it's impossible to even have uh, a, a view of all of it. So we have to kind of necessarily specialize in fragments. So, you know, look, we probably generate more documents today than it were ever generated in the entire history yeah, of the I, Roman Empire, I've right? I've heard so. we're the opposite, though. I've heard Canada has too much land, not enough history. <laughs> Middle East, no. too little land, yeah, too, too much, much history. history. Exact Absolutely. opposite. But let's just take, uh, Richard, uh, something you've spent years of your life working on. I presume you think it's a good thing that people know that this country started in 1867 as a confederation and Sir Johnny MacDonald was the first prime minister. Tell us why that's worth knowing. Well, it's, it's worth knowing for the basic rule, basic fact, in my judgment, I'm pretty confident of it, but I, it's, it, I can't prove it, <coughs> that no MacDonald, no Canada. I mean, we, we were a nonsensical, okay. idiotic why country. Why do we even need to know that? Well, it tells us something about our nature. It's something that all those Canadians in between us and, uh, and 1867, a lot of them had to spend a lot of time trying to keep this country going because it made 
no sense, candidly, made no sense, Canadians could overnight become a whole lot better off, a whole lot richer by becoming American. And they wouldn't do it. Tell a 20-year-old today why it's important that she knows that. She knows, she or he, it might be a he, that it's possible, that, that Canada has a story that is quite distinct. And what is fascinating about this country is we started at the bottom of the ladder. You know, everybody who knew something about Canada in 1867 assumed we would disappear. Assumed there was no reason for it. Today, we are one of the most successful countries in the world. So you would argue that so that story So how do we get from there is, to there? That's a great story. That is a great story. At least, I think it's a great story. We are not a dramatic country. We don't, we are not powerful in any real sense. If we disappeared tomorrow, there would be, there would be parts of the world that would, would, would regret it because they'd like to be here. In fact, you know, let me just go one little thing about, this is history, but it's history of today. If every person in the world who have answered surveys by saying that if they had a choice, they'd rather live in Canada than where they were, came here, our population wouldn't be 35 million, it would be 2 billion and 35 million. Hmm. Now that is a sign, that is a pretty good story. Yeah. Uh, and so there is a story in Canada, but so much of it is told in such unbelievably boring ways. Well, that's his that fault. It, no, well, that's it, these guys' fault. Well, in a way, I don't want to be personal, well. but you've got to write so people want to read Sean, and hold it. Is that your fault that you guys can't teach our, our wonderful story properly and that's why so few people are interested in it? Well, I don't disagree that uh, historians need to engage their audiences, certainly. And, and to get back to the earlier question about is it important for Canadians to know about the past, I certainly think it's true, but I don't think that the obligation falls entirely on the shoulders of ordinary people. It certainly falls on the shoulders of Chris and I, who are paid to be historians at our public universities. And so we do have, I think, a kind of obligation to act as translators about the past to make that knowledge known to wider audiences as best as possible. On the other hand, though, I do come to the defense of unpopular history. Stories about the past that have no market. And I, I read a book about a year ago from a, a colleague who wrote uh, a history of the drainage of the wetlands of southern Manitoba. Now, this is not a book that is going to sell millions of copies and chapters, right? But the history of the Hundreds drainage... Of thousands, of, but not millions. Oh, certainly, <laughs> yes, yeah. But, but her, her research revealed something quite fundamental about the uh, constitutional relationship between Manitoba and the federal government that I had never known before, that Manitoba, of the three prairie provinces, began to get control over its natural resources quicker than Saskatchewan and Alberta because they were draining swamplands and able to get those swamplands within their jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. That's quite significant for understanding mm -hmm. our constitutional history. It's never going to sell. And so there's still, I think, a place for an academic, unpopular history. If I can yeah, de sure. defend the professors on the panel just for a moment, I think, okay. I, just, <laughs> just for a moment, I said, but I, I, I think for a lot of the time, by the time a student gets to the university level or even the college level, they're either going to love history or they're going to hate it. Because I think the real failings in our historical education come way before that. I mean, my, my wife teaches, uh, well, she teaches grade four in Ontario now. She used to teach grade seven. And that was the first year that students in Ontario are really taught history. And I remember grade flipping. Grade seven? Eh, at, at least at the time. Things may have changed since she moved to a lower grade. I remember flipping through the history textbook, which I, obviously as a teacher, she had a copy of it. And I remember thinking, I mean, I'm a guy with two degrees in history. I put down the textbook. I'm like, this is awful. Like, I am totally bored by the story of this country because there's no story here. It's a, it's a collection of random figures and some anecdotes that don't really uh, come together in any coherent way. It's very, it's very delicate. It's like, well, there were native peoples here and bad things happened, but we won't dwell on that. And there are two major language groups in this country and they don't always get along, but let's not get into the nitty gritty of that. It was just, it was totally averse to controversy, anything exciting or Pablum. dramatic. It was Pablum at its worst. And you know, th uh, my own experience going back about 15 years now, our school wasn't much better. It was basically the, the history of Canada was Confederation, Vimy Ridge, hippies were done. And, you know, <laughs> by the time you get, it was, it was interesting enough. I mean, it got better in the latter third. But uh, by the time you actually get to the university level, I mean, if you are, if you have a love for history, you've found it on your own. Well, you've gone out of your way to find Chris, it. Chris, do we fear, I mean, America has its own myths and lies, if you like, about their history. Do we fear getting into that controversy here and maybe that's dumbing it down or making it too pablum? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, we do in the sense that Canada's the myth of Canada as this you know, multicultural country that gets along. Um, certainly the current government doesn't believe in the myth and, and is happy to tear it down and how it approaches history. 
Um, but I think the u unique Canadian thing is, as a stranger thing, is if you look at Brit the, you know, the Britain, the population of only twice that of Canada. But if you look at the, the, the popular historians, the, the market for history books, it's huge. It's 10 times at least more than Canada. So what's the so difference? There's, so there's, I, I don't know, but there's something beyond just the professors. And, and I'll be as hard on professors as anyone. I think we ought to be uh, writing and, and m making uh, 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 websites and documentaries how, as how much about, for the public. Okay, how about but they've, got a, uh, they've got a thousand year head start on us, does that matter? Uh, that, 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 when, when I taught in the UK, that, 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 that's what they always told me, is that Canada, what history? has no history. But I, well, that's not true, though. If you think about, I mean, even the history about British involvement in World War II probably dwarfs uh, everything about, about all of Canadian history. Sure. So I don't think Deanne, that's new. Deanne wanted to come in here. Deanne, let's hear from you on this. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, the, the discussion took all sorts of forms right now, but I would like to address the question, is, is it important to know our history? And uh, I mean, I, my answer is absolutely. I mean, if you, if I, if you allow me to do a parallelism at the subjective level, which people right now, they are constantly wondering about their own history, you know, psychoanalysis, they're always questioning their traumas of the past. I believe history at the collective level is identity forming and it's empowering. And they, like if you think, for instance, Quebec, like what in Quebec they did with this wonderful idea of putting on their cars the plaque, je me souviens, which means I remember. And I think it's so important because we, we are going through through a moment where amnesia, there is like the collective amnesia. Like we don't know where we come from, we don't know where we're going, and we are stuck in the present, and we are trying, you know, to deal with life uh, as well as we can. And uh, I come from a different background. I'm, I'm Mediterranean, I'm Italian, Greek, Egyptian, and I lived in a world where history was overwhelming. My mom, before going, when I, before I sleep, which sometimes gave me nightmares, she was, you know, giving me uh, lectures on Greek mythology and so on and so forth. So there is something which is, a, a, according to me, a, an absolute necessity to citizenship, to be aware where we came from, and also be aware that this is a narrative. Obviously, uh, the history uh, is representative of the people who wrote it. You know, it's not everybody who contributed in writing history. But there is this necessity to be able to see uh, who we are as Canadians, as uh, Quebecois, as Greeks, as Americans, in order to be able to become um, uh, individuals, you know, to become citizens. Because otherwise, uh, there is this ephemeral thing happening, which is very much related to the internet, by the way, where you need something, okay, I need that date, I need that name. You go get it, but after that, it falls in the abysses of this collective amnesia, you know? Hmm. That's so interesting. This is how you said I see it. Uh, two two quick follow-ups on that. I, I, you tell me if I'm wrong, but I thought the Je me souviens on the Quebec license plate wasn't just I I remember, it was. We. Oui. The inference was, I remember what those English bastards did to us back in the day. That's, that's what I think the inference well, is. And the second thing... The plaques are not large enough to write all that. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Now, the second thing is, this who is knows exactly what's on the Ontario yeah. license plate? Does anybody know? Something really boring. Keep it beautiful. It's, I, it's either yours to discover or keep it beautiful. Yeah. I don't even know anymore. Yes, but, but I don't what is either. yours to discover? That's, that's a real lost opportunity, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, well, yeah, but I don't. Surely Ontario you could do something not, better than that. Let's face it, it's not <laughs> exciting. Ontario is very sensible, and all the rest, of it, but it is not exciting. How it doesn't move your soul. How can you say that? That's just so not true. Well, it, this, is a, this is a Canadian problem. I mean, to put it in the most brutal way, our problem in terms of getting a history that people respond to is we didn't kill people. We had a popular revolution in 1837, three blocks north of this I studio. I know, but it, I'm not talking about Ontario. That was pretty small. But in general, if you go through the entire Canadian record, you have great difficulty finding people that we killed. This is most unusual among... The natives. Well, of course, I knew you were going to say that, but then even there, the number of Métis, the number of Métis killed was very few. Fifty? Something like that of, of, of Riel's when he and he started the rebellion in McDonald's time. Yeah, but even whatever you pile in as, uh, and try to increase the list of things we did badly—that is, people kill people—it is tiny compared, compared to anybody what? else in the world. Just about. I mean, you know, if you live in Afghanistan, there's, you know, what, what you'd laugh at the notion that Canada kills people. So, or most countries in the world, and. The truth, the hard truth is, I mean, go back to Shakespeare. You need people dying on stage to hold the audience. <laughs> let's, let's, uh, okay, I, I, I want some hard concrete 
facts on our list now then. Give me something that as, some, as a Canadian citizen you need to know about history. Just give me one thing. Chris. Responsible government. You need to know need how to responsible, responsible government, government, how it came and together. Everything and would have happened in 2008. The coalition crisis would have been very different if, if we knew about responsible government. And people would have laughed at, at, at Stephen Harper when he got up and said, Stefan Dion doesn't have the right to form a government doing something illegal. If people knew about responsible government, the history of responsible government, how parliamentary democracy works, everyone would have chuckled, right? And you, you could still have sided with him and thought that this was a bad thing to do after an election, but you would have understood the way the system works. We don't have an American system. We have a parliamentary democracy. We elect parliaments, we not governments. parliaments, not governments. And everything that was being proposed was legal if ill-advised. Gotcha. Go ahead. I'd say the most important fact of Canadian history for Canadians to know is uh, about uh, treaties and displacement of Indigenous people. We live in a country that is divided into Indian space and non-Indian space, and there are reasons for that. I often describe to my students the treaty process as the Second Confederation, that the boundaries of Canada were defined politically among Euro-Canadians uh, at conferences in Charlottetown and Quebec. But the true boundaries of the country weren't finalized until the 20th century when the treaties were extended into the north, and they're still not finished. Right. Uh, Dion, you don't have to give us the most important thing in Canadian history, but just tell us something people ought to know. Absolutely. I agree with uh, the, all the rapport, the colonizing rapport, the colonization, the history of Canada before. Uh, it was colonized, and also uh, the history of the indigenous people. As an immigrant, I know by now, I've been in Canada for almost 40 years, I know everything I think about the two founding nations, whatever they call themselves, but I, I don't know much about uh, the indigenous people, the First Nations, and uh, I think it's an absolute necessity from an immigrant perspective, specifically. Matt? I would stick with what would have been the self-styled two founding nations, the how the French and the English in this country intersect. Particularly, I would say, the last 50, 60 years, the rise of Quebec nationalism as it is. I think this is something that we're going to need to worry about and say the next generation, so it would help to know how the last two went. Richard. The condition of Aboriginal people is quite clearly our biggest moral uh, uh, challenge and our biggest moral failure. There's no question about that, whatever. It's our big, as a nation, it's our, the big thing we did badly, we did wrong. But that said, uh, I think we should stop lashing ourselves. It's almost masochistic. The fact is that this country is unquestionably one of the most successful countries in the world. Now, how many historians say that? For practical purposes, zero. Hmm. I've never seen a historian say, but it's obvious. You just look at any international uh, survey, and the Scandinavians are always up at the top. They're good guys and so on. But we are right up there. So, and it is, it is almost baffling to me, it's slightly ridiculous. This country goes on clinging to the notion that we are bad people. Obviously, the danger of recognizing that you are one of the most successful nations in the world is, of course, you get smug and, and go flat in your face and deserve to. But basically, that is the case with this country, against, which is achieved against the odds. This is a story that no historian has even begun to talk about. What the hell is going on? So let's do a little history right here. So Laurier was right when he said the 20th century shall belong to Canada. Well, he was wrong because he was, <laughs> he was wrong when he, what he said because the 20th century we weren't that great. But we've come in the last end of the 20th century, the 21st, to the top. Look, I mean, our cultural policy of immigration and of multiculturalism is not merely the best in the world. There is nothing remotely like it. Now, we are a dull little country, you know, by anybody else's standards. And yet we have done, in the, one of the most difficult areas of all, which is multiculturalism, coming to terms with the reality that the world is now globalized, we have, can teach anybody in the world. When have we ever taught the world? There is actually one other thing. We have banks that don't go bankrupt and don't cheat us. That's, <laughs> that's rather big. But on the two most important issues of our time, we are number one, or very close to it. I think, you know, to Richard's point as well, I find it interesting, I mean, the idea of having having an awareness of where your country has sinned, I think, is an important thing. Knowing what you have done badly is, impo is as important as knowing what you did right. But I think, on the other hand, perhaps if we weren't quite so guilty, 
maybe there wouldn't be this hesitation to look to the past for wisdom. I mean, there is wisdom there. There are things to feel guilty about, but there's things that have been done well, and I think we do focus often too much on the things we've done badly and not enough on the wonderful things we have done because, you know, Richard, you, I mean, you say we're a dull little country. You're absolutely right, and thank God for that. I mean, the, the being a boring country, it's, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, I think all countries in the world should aspire to be as dull as we are. They'll live longer. Should, should we accept that there is a... I don't know what you want to call it, Chris. Do you want to accept that there's a new normal today and the new normal is people know less history and don't care about it as much and we just have to live with that? I'll take you on the second half, not the first. Okay. I don't know if they know less history, as I said, but I think they care less about it, absolutely. And in fact, we've said it a few times, uh, people said tonight, that there's also, even the idea of having facts and, 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 and reality seems to be vastly less important to people anyway. So it's not just history, it's across the board. The idea that you would explain something in context that you would get a story right uh, has just been obliterated, uh, whether you're talking about Rob Ford or, 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 or anyone else. The idea that there is the truth here, that something actually happened, uh, is hard to sell. Now, Sean, having said that, we're going to hear a lot of history this year because it was 100 years ago this summer that World War I began. Yeah, that's right. This is a moment, right? This is a potential moment for folks like you to do a job. Absolutely. I mean, anniversaries and uh, commemorative events are opportunities, I think, for us to remember uh, the past and to try and draw lessons from it. And, and I think significantly, to not just learn what happened in the past, but to recognize what's new. It's impossible to know what's novel or what's innovative if you don't know what's happened before. Um, one thing I would disagree with, though, is that when we think about that past, we think about that history, uh, we shouldn't be looking for deaths and murders as a way to keep us engaged. Um, there are a lot of uh, complexities to Canadian history, and in my experience with students, in fact, is that the complexity is really what draws them in. What really turns them off is myth-making, that kind of pablum version of Canadian history. It's the unusual aspects of it, and sometimes the shameful aspects of it that draw our attention. And I do think the wisest thing we can do is to celebrate our achievements, but not forget upon whose backs they were built. What particular history are you teaching right now? I teach uh, environmental history, uh, and so we, we delve into the very deep past. We go into geological time right up to modern time, uh, and we look at Canadian history from a uh, kind of unusual perspective. So I teach a, a section of my class on the introduction of horses to Canada as a novel species that huh. was introduced by the Spanish in the uh, 15th, 16th centuries and migrated up into Canada. A really unusual aspect of Canadian history that doesn't usually get into Canadian history textbooks. That's the kind of complexity I think that draws people in. Did you pitch that class to the university? Uh, it's actually a course that's been taught at York since the 90s. Is that it right? uh, got picked up again in the last few years. How many students take it? it? Uh, we cap at 90 students in that class. You have 90 students in that class? Uh, I haven't hit 90 yet. Uh, we've uh, had a max of 75, but we cap it at uh, 90. That's not bad, you know. Yeah, there is some interest, I think. Huh. Seeing history in a different way. Should we, Richard, accept the fact that the new normal is knowing less and not caring? Well, there are the opportunities which uh, Sean has just talked about, uh, given by these anniversaries that are coming up. And it's a fluke, the timing, but it's very exciting because <clears throat> there's the obvious one for the Confederation in 2017, and there's the whole First World War. But there are other totally different kind of uh, celebrations that we can do. I mean, the women's vote in 2018. Uh, the invention of uh, the discovery of insulin by Canadians, mm. which resulted, that was in 22. Uh, and they, which resulted in our first ever um, uh, Nobel Prizes. And what is beautiful about the story is two people got the vote, two Canadians got the vote, and they both agreed that two others should have got the vote. And they gave half of their Nobel Prize to the two others, uh, who, who should have got it, actually. One who got it, the Nobel Prize officially, was a man called McLeod, who really didn't do very much, but it doesn't matter. But they, they, that's a beautiful story in itself. If, uh, my, if Michael Bliss were here, he would say, Michael Bliss, panting and best, call up in the cloud. Yes, he, won he, he wrote a very good, fine book he on He sure it. did, Discovery. <clears throat> but those are inter and the, and then the start of the, what became the National Hockey League. So that we don't have to have just soldiers and politicians. I can't believe, as we're doing anniversaries here, that you, with your two volumes on Sir John A., are not going to point out that this Saturday is his 199th birthday, and we are... Attempting, I guess, to create some momentum to the bicentennial of his birthday next, next year. Yeah, but I didn't want anybody to think I was just flogging my book for, <laughs> to make some money. <laughs> well, that's okay. Flog away. Uh, Deanne, again, we're, we're, we have two yes. streams sort of going here. On the one hand, 100th mm -hmm. anniversary of World War I and the opportunity that represents versus yes. some apathy that seems to be something we're concerned about here. How do you see that? 
playing out? Uh, actually, I think that, uh, as my colleague said earlier, uh, every moment has to be seen because, if, as we know, I mean, we're working with the media. Uh, the media will make a big thing out of these anniversaries, and the and the younger generations they watch. You know, they're very much in tune with what's happening. You know, in, in the media, uh, so we have to seize the moment. But I, I believe, in a, in in a more uh, diachronical uh, level, uh, uh, the the, the um, importance of uh, teaching history and uh, insisting on the uh, knowledge of history before coming to the university is very important. I know that uh, this domain, this subject has been neglected in the curriculum of the uh, of the high schools and uh, this is, I believe it's part of the problem is that uh, the, 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 the uh, younger Canadians, uh, they, they definitely don't see why they have to uh, to, to even address, you know, these these events. So the, the, the thing, something has to be done diachronically and synchronically, because I, I, I fear that uh, we are at a turning point, and with this uh, extremely uh, fascination that uh, extreme fascination that young people have with the new technologies. Uh, I have the impression that unless we do something, and I, when I say something, it's at all levels, uh, uh, poets, artists, uh, everybody should contribute to this uh, um, uh, this project of keeping our history alive and making it relevant and specifically showing to the young people how for them, because we live in a, in a world which every person sees themselves as an individual, and uh, somebody who's very much embodied in their own problems, how it can be relevant for them. Well, let me follow up on that, because we, we've talked about the role of the author, we've talked about the role of the history professors. I want to talk about the role of the mass media. How well is the mass exactly. media doing at keeping people engaged in their history? Not well. Uh, we don't have, frankly, I mean, it's, it's just if I focus on print, which is my usual, uh, uh, usual area of expertise, we have so few pages left because we have so little advertising that we give over as much as possible to what happened yesterday. We have very little time left for what may have happened 100 years ago. But there are, there are signs of hope, I think, and I think, uh, as has been said, we need to leverage technology to do this. One of the things I thought was magnificent was uh, about six weeks ago, the 50th anniversary of Kennedy's assassination in Dallas, where uh, there, were, there were long essays and television specials and radio specials. Um, all of them were pretty interesting. One of the most, uh, I thought, brilliant things ever was the Associated Press on their Twitter feed tweeting in real time yes. on a 50-year echo yeah. the wire messages that were going on. President Kennedy has landed in Dallas. President Kennedy is giving his uh, breakfast speech. Shots fired in Dealey Plaza. It was cheap. It was massive. It sent sh uh, chills down my spine. It was an echo of history in real time across 50 years. If we do more things like that, we'll do a far better job than if we just go out and commission some essays that maybe 10% of people will bother reading. That was brilliant. What about, uh, you talked about school curriculum earlier. Could we be, should we be doing a better job of teaching history in those younger grades? Matt, I think you were saying we didn't get history taught until grade 7 at one point in this province. How about that? Uh, you're asking a university professor to talk about uh, elementary and secondary yeah. education. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the worst person to answer. Well, but yeah, we ought to be I'm doing asking it. you because, of course, by the time they get to you, yeah. the interest in history is either there or it's not, probably. Yeah. Uh, should we be doing a better job? Yeah, I mean, when I look at the, the elementary, secondary textbooks, I, I think they're, they're, they're deadly dull as well. I have the exact same, I, I have the exact same response. And I think it's, it's partly it's because over the last 30, 40 years, we've been doing all this hodgepodge. As when Dion was saying, we've had this fragmentation and we just don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to bring it all back together and tell a fascinating story. But I think we have hit rock bottom, as we were saying earlier. I think actually people are starting to try and figure out, okay, how do we tell this story? We've got to throw some stuff out. We have to, we can't tell everything. Mm -hmm. So I think we're at a moment where people are asking these questions and they're going to start com coming up with these stories that'll, that will then trickle down into people writing textbooks. You can push people to it. You can say, this is the very, these are the bare bones. This is the spine of our history. And here's the billion things you can go out and specialize in. You can go out and go anywhere once you have this information, but this is what you need to know first. This is where we start, and then after that, the whole world is yours. Also, just one thing to add but to the idea of the early education, elementary or secondary school, it's not just that the textbooks are dull, it's being taught by non-experts. I mean, of the teachers I actually were taught history by, 
there's probably half a dozen. Maybe one of them actually considered himself a history teacher. The rest were math teachers who had, oh, okay, well, this term, I got to pick up one hour a day of history. Or English teachers saying, well, okay, I guess because I read a lot, I'm, I'm the guy teaching history this term. So and kids can tell, can't they? Oh, absolutely. They can tell and, if the teachers. And, just and their interest wasn't anyway. much just deeper than the textbook. The teachers, though, if the textbooks had not been engaging, and Chris, you might agree with me, with first year students, Nine out of ten times when I ask my students why they've taken a course at the university level, it's because of a teacher, a history mm. teacher that they engaged with at mm. high school. And so they are our best feeders for students at the university level, certainly. So if there's anything we can do at the high school level is to make sure that those teachers are supported well enough so that they can continue mm. to inspire those students to take courses at university. We've got a few minutes left here, and let me put one more issue on the table. And Deanne, I'll start with you since uh, the person I want to talk about is actually in the same city that you're in right now. And that is our uh -oh. prime minister. <laughs> We have yes. <laughs> a prime minister who is a history nut. Yeah. We have a prime minister yeah. who cares a great deal about history and, in fact, has just written a book. Yes. It's about hockey. It's about mm -hmm. hockey history. <laughs> Does yes. having a prime minister on the case, as it were, matter? Absolutely, definitely. You know, I think it's very important that whoever is the head of the state has to show that our country is not born uh, two minutes ago, you know, and that we have to revisit the past. Obviously, I mean, in the case of a conservative government, it goes without saying. The, the emphasis is on the word conservative. The conservatives, they conserve things, right? <laughs> They're not bypassing and, you know. So it, 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 it's too bad, you know, that not every prime minister should be uh, engaged with this uh, nation building, identity building in, on a daily basis. You see, it's like this is it. We, ca we cannot again create parentheses. Now we do history, now we do real life. Uh, this uh, interaction, this interface between the two has to be orchestrated and I believe that if we have a, a, a head of state who's very much in, interested in, in history, it will trickle down to the Department of Education, to the other uh, spaces where the, uh, the citizen, citizenship is, is built, you know, so I think it's a very good thing. I, don't I think commend the Prime him Minister for that. Has to put the money where his mouth is on this, though. He may speak a lot about his interest in history, but the way the dollars uh, go, they do not go to history. The folks at the Library and Archives of Canada would surely disagree, and certainly the folks at DFO and the libraries, where books are DFO? being tossed in the garbage, what? Department of Fisheries and Oceans, they're shutting down most of their regional libraries right now, and a huge trove of materials that are of extreme significance to environmental historians to know the baseline history of our fisheries, of our rivers and our lakes, is literally being thrown in the garbage mm -hmm. as we speak. The major library in Winnipeg has mm -hmm. just been closed. They left the books open for anyone from the public or uh, private sector to come and take, and the remainder of them have been chucked. Hmm. Richard, the reason I ask the question is we, we have over the past almost couple of years now um, you know, had quite a focus on the 200th anniversary of the War of 1812. Yep. Quite a focus in the province of Ontario, where much of the war was fought. Mm -hmm. You do public opinion surveys from across the country, though, and it didn't, I mean, the, the whole campaign initiated by the federal government kind of landed like a lead balloon. It didn't, uh, the, the numbers showed that people weren't that interested in it. What do well, we do with not that? In, <coughs> that interested outside Ontario and Quebec to a certain mm -hmm. degree. Uh, no, there wasn't, I mean, because nothing happened elsewhere. Mm -hmm. but, but that's the nature of Canada. You know, there are very few things that are Canadian coast to coast, you know. Uh, uh, but I, I disagree with what's been said. I mean, this government, ha the, the issues you raise uh, and to do with uh, the um, uh, archives, is, you're quite correct on that. I don't know about the other one, the one that's just been in the newspapers about the fisheries library. But the government is trying. I mean, it has put money into, it put too much money actually into 1812, you know, and it would have done better to spread it out into other areas. But that was the start. It is putting money into uh, celebration of uh, confederation in 2017. It's putting money into celebration of John A. McDonald's uh, uh, birthday, anniversary of birthday. It's the first government to do that. Uh, you find it very hard. I mean, the last thing the Liberals did was said no to a national ga portrait gallery. I mean, you know, the Liberals aren't so perfect. But they made a war museum. <laughs> I know they did. Isn't that funny? Because everybody said, well, that's what Harper will do. He's going to try and turn us into a military nation. Is the money... but, I mean, wait a second. The Liberals did that, besides also sending our troops to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the, this, is, this is strange that when a government, not, not with impeccable accuracy and all the rest of it, does try to move into the area of encouraging um, history, attention to history. The basic response of historians is to say, no, I don't trust you, you should not do it. Sadly, folks, sadly, we're history.
Time's up. <laughs> Thank you all for coming in. Diane Pecon, great to have you on the line in the nation's capital Thank once again. Thank you so much. Of course, uh, the four Thank of you, you here in the studio, we've all forgotten the main reason why you should study history, and that is it's fun. <laughs> That's the best reason to do it. Good of you all to join us this evening here at TVO. Thanks so much. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.